Good evening and a very warm welcome to this online event brought to you by St Hilda's College, the first Dance Ox, that's Dance Scholarship Oxford event of 2022. I'm Georgina Paul and I'm currently the acting principal of St Hilda's and it's my very great pleasure to welcome back to Dance Ox our honorary fellow, Dame Monica Mason, dancer extraordinaire and former artistic director of the Royal Ballet and Jane Pritchard, Curator of Dance at the Victoria and Albert Museum. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Professor Sue Jones, who will introduce our speakers this evening properly. But before I do so, I want to just say a word about the importance of Dance Socks to St Hilda's. Dance Socks was founded by Sue Jones in 2013, the centenary year of the premiere of Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring, in a sensational production by Diagoles Balehus that made dance history. Since then, Dance Ox has hosted an extraordinary series of events, including historical lectures, such as we will hear this evening, on particular productions, or exploring the work of specific choreographers and dancers. But it is also under the aegis of Dance Ox that contemporary choreographers and dancers, some of the finest of our day, have come to St Hilda's to work in the Jacqueline Dupre Music Building, rehearsing and creating work here. It's been a privilege for our students, our staff, and our loyal Dance Ox audiences to witness some remarkable creative artists working right in front of our eyes. This programme is unique in Oxford and unique nationally, and its originality in creating an interface between academic scholarship and creative practice enabling audiences to experience dance performance with the investigative insights of the scholar is an exciting aspect of what St Hilda's is about. We're a college that appreciates the imaginative dimension of scholarly study and is interested in putting scholarship at the service of the creative arts. I will hand over now to Sue to introduce our distinguished speakers this evening and hope you enjoy the lectures. Well, thank you. Thank you, Georgina. <clears throat> Thanks for such a full and generous description of the activities of Dance Ox and for showing us how its role is in the college and beyond. I'm Sue Jones, as Georgina said, Director of Dance Ox, and it's my pleasure and privilege to thank you all warmly for joining us tonight for two sparkling talks. We are delighted to welcome back Dame Monica Mason and Jane Pritchard, who return as friends of Dance Ox and guest speakers for this event. We wish tonight could have been held in person, and we had originally envisioned a glamorous fundraising dinner following the talks. So Dance Ox is especially grateful to you, Monica and Jane, for giving us your time and talents anyway for a special online celebration. And don't forget it's Burns Night tonight, so we hope we'll all have a glass of whiskey at the end. But first, I'd like to thank St Hilda's and the Jacqueline Dupre Music Building. Without the college, Dance Ox would not be possible. Thank you to our acting principal, Dr Georgina Paul, to our patrons, Dame Monica Mason and Sheila Forbes, former principal of the college, for their ongoing support of our endeavors. And thanks to college personnel who've rallied to get this event online. Harris Ferguson for his technical wizardry, without whom we wouldn't be here. Marcus Bell for his ongoing support and advice. Marcus is a doctoral student at St Hilda's, completing his thesis on dance and tragedy but he still finds time to work as coordinator of Dance Ox. And I thank everyone in the development and events offices who've tweeted, Facebooked and social mediaed our event. I'm just wondering if that is actually a verb. But anyway, let's get to our speakers. Dame Monica is, as Georgina said, former principal dancer and director of the Royal Ballet. But her remarkable career took off when she was plucked from the corps de ballet at 16 by the great British choreographer Kenneth Macmillan to play the chosen maiden in the Rite of Spring. Subsequently, she rose in the ranks to direct the company, which is an extraordinary trajectory. 
Jane is a renowned dance historian, curator of dance at the V&A, and writer of many articles and books on dance history and curator of exhibitions. Both speakers have contributed mesmerizing presentations to past Dance Ox events, not just the initial writer's spring event, but a magical Dancing Lives conference and a stimulating symposium of the work of Kenneth Macmillan. You can find their fuller biographies in the YouTube description, so I'm just going to mention their most recent achievements. We are to congratulate Dame Monica on her election as Vice President of the Royal Academy of Dance. And if you are already familiar with Jane's distinguished co-curation of the Ballet Russe exhibition at the v &A, I'd commend you also to her current exhibition, On Point, a fascinating revelation of the often hidden histories of the Royal Academy. We've been fortunate that Monica and Jane have returned often to share with Dance Ox the experience of their profound understanding of and passion for the art form of dance and its traditions in both performance and in history. Thank you so much, Monica and Jane. So here's the order of business. After the talks and some discussion between Monica and Jane, Marcus will host the Q&A session. So do just put in your questions in the chat as we go along and Marcus will do his best to read as many as possible to the speakers. And finally, I'll see you again at the end for a word about the future of dance socks in these difficult times for the humanities. So to Tchaikovsky's 1890 Sleeping Beauty, which we're not going to be discussing, but first to Jane, whose talk marks the centenary of the first Diaghilev season of The Sleeping Princess in London, 1921. And to get us in the mood, I believe Jane is going to show us a preliminary slideshow. Thank you, Jane.
Right. Um, I was started with that because I, my original intention was as people arrived um, for the presentation that that could be playing ahead of time. And I am somebody who has a, a, a great faith in looking at images. They may be um, as questionable as any sort of written documentation, but I think to have some idea of the um, uh, production, what it looked like, is quite useful as I speak. So my presentation, the crown of my whole career, the Bally Roos production of The Sleeping Princess. And of course, as Sue mentioned, it is now the centenary of this production um, that took place in London. On the 2nd of November, 1921, two boys from Westminster School in their top hats and jam pot collars were among the audience at the Alhambra Theatre when the curtain rose on the production of Serge Diaghilev's uh, The Sleeping Princess, which he described in an interview in The Observer as the crown of my whole career. As one of the boys, John Gilgood, uh, his companion was Arnold Haskell, recalled 49 years later, it was a wild mixture of triumph and disaster. With the failure, obviously, of the transformation uh, seen with the forest growing and Lepokova slipping over as the enchanted princess uh, being more of the disastrous elements. The Sleeping Princess was performed in London from the 2nd of November 1921 to the 4th of February 1922, so we're just in the right time to celebrate it. And it counts as one of the most extraordinary productions in the history of Serge Diaghilev's Valley Russe. John Drummond was correct when he claimed that he managed to be both Diaghilev's greatest success and his most damaging failure. Artistically, it influenced the direction Bally took in Britain and through subsequent British productions uh, played a major part in the establishment of Pettipur's classics internationally. But it bankrupted the Bally Rus. Bronislava Najitska, um, Sorry, before I move on. Sorry, I'm not moving forward um, with the images. Never mind, I'll keep going and perhaps we'll catch up with the images at some point. Um, uh, Bronislava Najinska, um, uh, ballet mistress on the production, regarded it, regarded it as an absurdity, a dropping into the past, a mere non-entity. She had, of course, just returned to the Ballet Russe after working on an experimental program. Um, sorry. Just returned uh, from working on an experimental program in the Soviet Union. Right, and on to the next one. Thank you. Um, the production of The Sleeping Princess appeared both to contradict Serge Diaghilev's view of ballet, at least as stated at the outset of his career as a producer, and Leon Bach's description of great stage design as he now adopted a more realistic approach. Next one. Although regarding Petipa's multi-act ballet as out of date and in interminable when he began uh, presenting ballet in Western Europe, Diaghilev nevertheless overlooked, never overlooked the quality of Petipa's choreography. In his 1909 Saison Russe in Paris, the first season dominated by ballet, he included, he included an adaptation of the Pas de for the Bluebird and Princess Florine, initially under the title Oiseau Feu. Stagings of this Pas de initially as part of Le Festine, subsequently as a mini ballet in its own right, The Enchanted Princess, continued throughout the existence of the Ballet Russe. Le Festine, an umbrella title for a divertissement which changed over the seasons, in 1909 also included the Grandpa classique Hongrois from Raymonde. Diaghilev recognized that some of the Russian classics 
could potentially find a home in London, where the audiences were generally more conservative than in Paris. And it was for London, for example, that he uh, produced his first cut down Swan Lake. At the beginning of the 20th century, next image, uh, Russian dancers who were touring outside their homeland took examples of the classics with them, including the choreography of Marius Petipa. The three 1908 to 10 tours uh, in the Scandinavian countries and Eastern Europe, organized by Edward Faser, showed the off choreography by Petipa, including Complete Paquita, The Cavalry Halt, and Les Millions d'Aliquin. Adolf Baum, Lydia Kiasht, Theodore Kosloff, Tamara Kasavna, Olga Priya Brzezinska, and Anna Pavlova all included fragments of Petipa's choreography in their personal and group touring repertoires to Europe and America. Pavlova in particular was important in this, uh, in this respect, presenting the grandpa from Paquita, a two act version of Raymonda and several aspects of the Sleeping Beauty. Significantly needing to restore her company's finances in 1916, Pavlova agreed to have a production mounted of the Sleeping Beauty as the central uh, act of the big show at the Hippodrome New York. While in the planning stages, it must have seemed just the spectacular ballet that would work in the vast Hippodrome. In practice, it was far too sophisticated for the audience and it was impossible to do justice to the choreography in less than an hour. Leon Baxt was invited to design the production and some of those designs on paper looked very similar to his 1921 ideas. Although the vast wide uh, set as realized lost the intended perspective. Baxter was not in the United States to supervise the production and the Christian Science Monitor described Pavlova as a jewel in a garish setting. The back scenery and costumes were all that could be desired but there was no Joseph Urban to, ma to work magic with lighting and apparently no one can mold the Hippodrome Chorus into the semblance of a ballet worthy of Pavlova. And I think the sort of stretching of the set is one of the problems visually as we look at um, the images. This was not Pavlova's only staging of the Sleeping Beauty. The act three, Padada, uh, Aurora's wedding, uh, Padada, occasionally featured in her repertoire. And from 1918, she presented act two as Visions, which when it came to Covent Garden, some London critics found more effective than Diaghilev's epic production. In addition, on her 1921-22 USA tour, Pavlova presented fairy tales, essentially the final act of Etismont, appearing as Aurora herself. This was, of course, before Diaghilev had made Aurora's wedding a popular divertissement for his own company. Next image. The audiences in the West had tasted uh, Petipa's, oh, that the audiences in the West had tasted Petipa's choreography, possibly encouraged uh, Diaghilev in his venture to stage The Sleeping Princess. It was, however, rare for London audiences to attend a full evening ballet. Unlike Russia, in most of Europe, ballet had been programmed as part of mixed uh, bills, whether in music hall and variety, or in conjunction with opera or drama. Indeed, it was Pavlova and Diaghilev who changed audiences' expectations to accept a full evening of dance. Even so, moving from a mixed uh, repertory to one long work was a novelty. It was also a challenge uh, to present a long run of a single ballet. And the Sleeping Princess's run of 114 or 15 performances remains the third longest run of a ballet on the London stage. Matthew Bourne's Swan Lake now claims the crown for the number of performances for a full evening production, um, but never in a single run. Luigi Manzotti's Excelsior, staged by Carlo Coppi and presented at Her Majesty's Theatre in 1885, uh, clocked up 168 performances. Longer continuous runs can be found within ballets presented at the Alhambra and Empire, but they were shorter productions. Next image. The Sleeping Princess 
was a long, magnificent production. The St. Petersburg uh, Sleeping Beauty was in a prologue and three acts with five scenes. In London, five acts were reduced to four in December. Bax did not slavishly follow the original staging, so the entrances, for example, had to be reworked. The London critic, Cyril Beaumont, discussed how Diaghilev edited the ballet with knowledge, taste, and inspiration, bringing it slightly forward in time to the courts of Louis XIV and XV, and removing some of the weaknesses of the original version. Of course, he hadn't seen the original version, so how he could claim that, I don't know. He must have been told. Um, and it's uh, obviously Levinson who has got the, the sort of comparisons when one reads his descriptions. Although some effects have failed to work at the premiere, the production soon settled down and the audiences were privileged to watch the Mariinsky trained ballerinas as Aurora. Next image. The basic production was staged by Nicholas Segea, former register uh, of the Imperial Ballet. But Beaumont noted that once Segea had taught the dances, it was Nijinska who directed the rehearsals and provided new choreography where needed. It's worth considering Nijinska's role as something akin to that of Ninette de Valois when Segeev mounted the production for the Vic Wells Ballet, making the production more musical and inspiring. As had occurred with subsequent uh, productions, the core of the ballet came from Petipa, but was already, but already adaptations were being made and new variations inserted in the style of Petipa to suit the mood of the period. Although the full production of The Sleeping Princess was never seen again, from May uh, 1922, Aurora's Wedding, which combined the fairy variations of the prologue with the fairy tale divertisement of the last act, was produced. Next image. This was enormously popular throughout the 1920s and continued as a cornerstone of the second generation Bally Roos companies in the 1930s. It was through Aurora's Wedding that generations of ballet girls were introduced to Perry Pettifer's choreography. Next image. Prior to the production, Diaghilev was interviewed for The Observer. When asked why he changed the title from The Sleeping Beauty, he replied, yes, and turn it into a pantomime. That's just our reason for the change of title. We have no clown. In publicity, there was an emphasis on the wealth of dancers being presented and the continuity from the 1890 production with the involvement of the Italian ballerina Carlotta Brianza, creator of Aurora, and a popular dancer in London in the 1890s, now playing Carabos. Next image. The importance of the score by Piotr Tchaikovsky was acknowledged by Stravinsky in a letter to the Times, reprinted in the production souvenir programme. Changes were indicated by Stravinsky's note, I have instrumented some num numbers, which had remained unorchestrated and unperformed, leaving the critic of the times delighted to be permitted to enjoy the score uh, and remain in fashion. Diaghilev's interview, in Diaghilev's interview, he enthused over Bach's designs, which will be the richest ever conceived. They were indeed lavish. And the sets and costumes that survive give some impression of the grandeur of the production. Is further documented with photographs posed on the sets for Acts 1 and 4 stroke 5 because of the changing of the structure and illustrations of the ballet in action. Unfortunately, uh, the proposed experimental film of the production, planned to be in colour and with synchronated music, was never made. Next image. The Sleeping Princess was staged at the Alhambra Leicester Square which had been London's leading theatre for ballet since 1865. As Diaghilev said, we are delighted to be in Sir Oswald Stoll's house, the traditional home of ballet. In honour of the production, the theatre was partly redecorated by Sir, uh, Sir Oswald, so that the auditorium and the stage settings may harmonise. The theatre itself had seen an earlier season by the Ballet Russe, and it's important to be aware that although the Alhambra was traditionally known uh, as a palace of varieties, when the Ballet Russe danced there, they were not part of a mixed bill as they were 
when they performed at Stoll's larger flagship theatre, the London Coliseum. Next image. The production was largely based on the choreographic text from the Imperial Ballet in St. Petersburg. It's helpful to look at what obvious changes were made. These are indicated by studying the cast and the synopsis and by considering the different sets and the impact they made. The Argonis Ballet Russe lacked the resources of the Imperial Theatre, but it is significant that Andre Levinson, who was familiar with the original ballet, claimed that at the Alhambra, the Argonis reconstructed all that was imperishable in the work, that is to say, Petipa's dances and Tchaikovsky's score, and completely renewed everything ephemeral, such as the scenic effect and the coordination of the whole. Choreography by Petipa was staged by Sergeyev using the notation he bought from Russia uh, that survives at Harvard. No notation survives for Karabos attendance for the hunting scene before the start of Blind Man's Buff and none for the apotheosis, suggesting that these had to be freshly created. It is, however, recorded in the program that changes were made to the action scenes and new chore choreography introduced by Nijinska into the hunting scene, uh, dances in uh, scene three, and the fairy tales of Bluebeard, Bluebeard Scheherazade, and Innocent Ivan. For the next image. Dances such as the Garland Dance were affected by the cast and stage space being considerably smaller in both respects than at the Mariinsky. I suspect that the choreography here should also be attributed to Nijinska. The makeup of the Ballet Russe had gone through a period of change both at the beginning and the end of World War I. And by 1920, the repertory had been, sorry, the repertory now decorated by Cubo futurist avant garde painters had become increasingly dominated by Leon Massine's ballets, which focused on the character rather than the academic choreography. It was therefore necessary to invite ballerinas trained at the Imperial Ballet to head the cast and inspire other dancers, and for teacher Enrico Cicchetti to give the company class, classes to sharpen the dancer's technique. It's fascinating to look at the makeup of the company for 1921 and 22. In the production, there were 62 named dancers, 29 men and 33 women, plus extras appearing as courtiers, pages, servants, beaters, Negro lackeys. The full identity of some company members is still difficult to fathom, uh, made more challenging by the inclusion of such performers as Komisarov, who appeared as one of Karabos's pages and a dignitary, and who was allegedly Spasitsova's Soviet minder. Next image. Dancers trained at the Imperial Valley uh, School made up four of the five auroras, Olga Spasitsova, Lubov Igorova, Vera Trevilova, and Lydia Lapokova. Both dancers who performed Prince Charming Pierre Vladimirov and uh, Anatole Vilzak, uh, also from the Imperial Theatre, as were the long-serving Lubov Chernicheva, Nicholas Kremnev, Ludmila Shola, as well as newcomer Filia Dubrovska. Next image. Eleven dancers from Warsaw were also part of uh, the Imperial Ballet, including Leon Wojciechowski and Stanislav Idzikowski, and 14 dancers from Moscow, at least half of those, uh, including the fifth Aurora, uh, Vera Nemchinova, having been trained in private schools. Um, nine named dancers were certainly British, including the experienced Lydia Sokolova and Hilda Buick. The men included Lukum, the son of the company pianist who joined as a dancer for the chance to learn about music for dance and to meet leading composers who became better known as the composer Leighton Lucas, and of course Patrykev, shortly to make his mark as Anton Dolan. Other British artists must have taken the numerous walk-on parts. Richard Buckle has noted that the magnificent Negro footmen were almost certainly guardsmen from the Wellington barracks blacked up, but this is not the place to discuss the challenge of blacking up in the Ballet Roost. 
to play the king and queen, Diaghilev invited uh, Nick's image. Um, the actor, Leonid, uh, Leonard Trier, and the beautiful Vera Sudikina, later Stravinsky. Roles that were later taken by company members, Helen uh, uh, Komaranov and Michael, Mikhail uh, Fedorov. Nicholas Sagaev, who was responsible for mounting the ballet, also appeared as a dignitary with his wife, Popolevska, as a lady in waiting, village maiden, and nymph. Nijinska uh, alternated with Lydia Lapokova as the Lilac Fairy, as well as dancing the Hummingbird Fairy in Act One and Pirate in Acts Four and Five. And the obviously the multiplicity of roles is, is uh, that the dancers take is absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's, it's significant that even the pages for the fairies in the, the pro, what we think of as the prologue um, are taken by leading dancers. Some of the changes that occurred are revealed by looking at the synopsis of the two productions. That for St. Petersburg is detailed, but for London, the programme synopsis was an adaptation of a version by uh, Arthur Quiller Cooch. Cyril Beaumont's account, given in his two-part impressions of the Russian ballet, The Sleeping Princess, written after watching numerous performances, is more reliable. It makes clear that Diaghilev compressed the time of the ballet's action from 120 years to 36. In Act Two, Aurora is 16 when introduced to her suitors. In St. Petersburg, she had been 20. The ballet's hunting scene occurs many years afterwards, perhaps 20 rather than a century later. This meant that Bach's designs could be rather more united than radically changing style for the second part of the ballet. Next image. The Argolev had six fairies in the prologue in addition to the Lilac Fairy and Carabos, so-called in the synopsis, but the Wicked Fairy in the cast list. Apart from Sokolova, the Cherry Blossom Fairy, Nemchinova, Carnival Fairy, Carnation Fairy, sorry, and uh, Klementovich, uh, occasionally Fairy of the Songbirds. The fairy variations were danced by Mariinsky ballerinas. The additional trio were all long-standing members of the Ballet Russe and would have studied with Cecchetti for years. Whereas the cast is generally reduced from that, sorry, elsewhere, the cast is generally reduced from that of the Mariinsky. Four rats, not six. Carabos's chariot, not wheelbarrow. The Aurora's coming of age, traditionally in Act One, was less populated. Not only was the garland waltz uh, on a much smaller scale, we have the next image, but there were no violin pages or girls with mandolins and only four maids of honour. And the knitting women apparently became four girls, presumably villagers, the villagers threading spindles. And I've just shown you there, so you've got sort of the sense of the, the difference uh, um, from the um, Seeking Princess and to a reconstruction of um, the original, uh, complete with a staircase and fountain. The production for this second act, while still a garden, was quite different from that in St. Petersburg. Aurora entered via a colonnade, which becomes a tradition in British-derived productions, rather than down the staircase and there is no fountain for the Lilac Fairy's appearance. It was nevertheless an impressive set. Indeed, it was described in the Dancing Times as perhaps one of the most magnificent examples of what can be done in stage illusion. Clipped and trimmed hedges of dark green leaves are piling one behind another up the hill on, on the summit of which stands a white stone castle. It's also worth noting that the same article praises the growth of the forest Next image, revealing that after the hitch at the premiere, it became a truly theatrical moment. There was no attempt at realism, but the illusionary effect was perfect. It was one of the most original and exact pieces of non realistic but illuminative stage effects it has ever been my good fortune to see. A hedgerow of imaginary trees was raised across the complete breadth of the stage. And through the foliage, the purple fairy, as she was often called, uh, engaged upon her benevolent task. This hedge-like growth was followed by another and another, and each closer to the audience. 
so that the castle and grounds were completely obliterated. Through an arch archway, the purple fairy advanced and the castle was lost to name and fame. Next image. The panorama journey after, a vision, after the vision scene was more elaborate in St. Petersburg than London. But even the London version with the pool transformed to a river on which a mother of pearl boat traveled with impressive transformative lighting was praised. The awakening scene in London was simplified during the run, next image, from an elaborate high bed overhung with the Imperial Eagle to a simple bed, which looked rather like a Juliet tomb, uh, overhung with cobwebs. This was at one point at which the effects were less impressive as the bed sank beneath the stage and the cobweb curtain was raised rather than destroyed. Nevertheless, the change allowed the action to move straight into the final act, the rearranging of the intervals. To appreciate the changes in the last act, let's have the next image. Uh, so the divertisement of the wedding, it's easier to tabulate the dances. The opening quartet had a commedia theme rather than the jewels of the Mariinsky. Cinderella's music is used for the scene with Bluebeard. Two, two dances from the Nutcracker were added. And of course, with Outer School um, attached to the company. Sorry, Tom Thumb disappeared. <coughs> so I'm just going to give you an idea there. Okay, moving on to the next image. Much has been made of the delayed opening and then technical failure of the first performance of The Sleeping Princess. The Alhambra's technical uh, technicians had neither the facilities or the experience of those at the Mariinsky. By the 3rd of December, a critic in the Daily uh, Telegraph proclaimed the production as an exemplification, exemplification of all the graces of classic dancing, allied to the music of art, scene painting, color blending, stage decor, and the rest surely excel in beauty and sheer artistic merit, uh, anything of its type seen in London in the last 30 years. In the Observer, the Observer also praised uh, Bach's contribution, saying that Bach's genius triumphs. No description can do, do justice to the splendor of Bach's decor or to the daring but always perfectly harmonized color orgy presented in ever new and exciting combinations in the costumes. He regarded Bax's designs as a snub to Bax's imitators. Bax has certainly retained the unity of rhythm that he has always rever reverted from suggestion and simplification to definite statements and overwhelming rich detail. He has become a realist, but an imaginative realist. Next image. Despite wide marketing by Stoll and the special occasions during the run of The Sleeping Princess, the visit of the King and Queen uh, on the 12th of December, when Queen Mary recorded in her diary that it was beautifully given and most enjoyable. And Maestro Cicchetti's Jubilee on the 5th of January, for which he returned to his created role of Carabos, audiences did not rush to this ballet. Vogue later listed it with the Ballet Russe's failures. Supporters who would have returned several times a season to catch mixed bills failed to return even to see changes of cast. Although a few diehard fans such as Cyril Beaumont watched the ballet repeatedly, as indeed did those two Westminster schoolboys. The Arglef, never good with money, had spent twice as much on the production uh, as was budgeted. So there was no way he could, as he had in initially hoped, make his fortune on this ballet. And indeed, he remained in debt to Stoll until 1924, curtailing his vi visits to Britain for two seasons. Next image. Although uh, a failure, The Sleeping Princess at the, at the Alhambra was one of the most influential ballets ever presented in Britain. Members of the dance fraternity were among those who did return to it repeatedly, and variations from the ballet became a feature of teaching ballet in Britain. Extracts quickly entered the repertoire of new British companies that ultimately became uh, Rombert and the Royal Ballet. In addition, both Ninette de Valois 
and Mona Inglesby invited Nicholas Sergeyev to mount the Sleeping Princess for their own companies. According to de Valois, Sergeyev was obsessed with achieving original effects of the Russian ballet, while she, with her 20th century theatre sensibility, was more concerned with securing the actual choreography and adapting it for fewer dancers and smaller stages. Sergeyev's 1947 short-lived staging for Inglesby, privately funded large touring company, was more faithful to Pettifer's original production, receiving less editing. Significantly, in the mid 20th century, when access to Russian ballet heritage was restricted outside the Soviet bloc, the Royal Ballet's version of Petipa's ballets mounted by Sergeyev became the basis for many productions in the Western world. Next image. Those technical hitches on the opening night made Diaghilev believe the production fated. It was undoubtedly a strain at a challenging time in his personal life. As he declared, I shall never do another production on this scale. It's too difficult. But no live theatre production should be judged on its first performance alone. Beaumont and the others at the time recognised the importance of The Sleeping Princess. It was one of the first declarations of the importance of classical ballet after the modernist revolution of the Ballet Russe. The Argolev was one of the first to say that this classical style was timeless and a constant source of inspiration. As his teacher, Serafine Astafieva, told Dolin, that is what ballet was at the Mariinsky. Thank you very much. Jane, thank you. Sue, are you going first? No, I was just going to thank Jane enormously for that. And um, uh, because I couldn't get my video on. Okay. I thought it was completely wonderful, Jane. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, yes, indeed. I think, um, Jane, what we can what we can do here is move swiftly on to Demonica's talk because there are such obvious connections here and we'll she's going to tell us about the uh, indeed the tradition that had been established that continues to be established with the Royal Ballet now still performing Sleeping Beauty. Dame Monica thank you so much for coming and I think it's your turn now. <laughs> thank you very much I hope I stay connected because I've had one little blip already so far this evening. Um, I, I've had, I, I suppose, a love affair with The Sleeping Beauty, uh, well, for 65 years. I first encountered um, a mime class when I was 15 years old and first went to the Royal Ballet School. And we were being taught the mime that Ursula Morton did as the queen and Ursula Morton was conducting the class. I had never seen Sleeping Beauty. I didn't know what the queen was saying. It was all a complete mystery to me. And then later on, while I was there, um, Harold Turner, who taught Pas de Deux, and of course, who danced with Mona Inglesby, uh, Harold Turner announced to the class that we were going to be studying the bluebird. And I didn't know what the bluebird was. And of course, he looked at me and said, Monica, you're looking a little blank. I said, well, I've never seen the Sleeping Beauty, so I don't know what the bluebird is. So I think time went on and I don't really remember when I ever got to see the Sleeping Beauty. And it might actually be that I have only really watched the entire ballet since I made the production that I did with Christopher Newton in 2006. I mean, how about that for saying something? Of course, I have seen other companies, but here in London, I don't think, I think that's the true story. I think the outstanding memory for me at the Royal Ballet School was when Kasavana came to give a lecture to the class that I was in on the fairies of the prologue. 
Well, by this time, I, I suppose I was a little bit more um, informed about the Sleeping Beauty. But during the year that I was at the ballet school, the company were actually on tour in America for half of that year. And I know for certain that when they came back, they were not performing the Sleeping Beauty. So I had actually, I actually joined the company and began to learn all the corps de ballet roles before I'd actually ever seen the ballet. Because Savina's lecture on the fairies was completely bewitching. She was 70 years old by now, but we were all mesmerized. And of course, what struck me was that she would talk about all the time, she would say, Petipa wanted it like this. Petipa asked us to do this. And of course, this was, you know, a name conjured out of the distant past to me. I couldn't believe that I was hearing somebody describing what Petipa had actually wanted in terms of qualities. And one of the things, in fact, the only thing that I remember out of that lecture, and it's still vivid to me, was her description of the movement of the arms, the port de bras for the third fairy, the, the woodland glade fairy, in which she described the, the, the movement of the arms slowly, slowly wafting over your head. She said, Petipa described the movement as being the wind blowing across the wheat fields of Russia. Now, I don't know quite why that stuck in my mind. It appealed to me so much. It just conjured up the most wonderful image. I could see the wheat fields and I could see the wind blowing them. Years later, when I came to be being rehearsed in this variation by Sir Frederick Ashton, he said to me, you know, Monica, your arms are all just waving about where I'm not seeing any clarity. I don't see a finished position. So I told him why I was aiming for this particular clarity or this uh, particular quality. And he said, because Savina said that. Well, that's a long time ago. I want to see you finish the movement. So of course, I now had to juggle with this dilemma. Here was Sir Fred telling me how to do it. And, and of course I'd fallen in love and worshiped Kasavina's comments for many years by this time. And so I suppose I tried to accommodate both of them. I don't know with what success. Um, when I joined the Royal Ballet in, in 1958, they'd only recently become the Royal Ballet, not it was no longer Sadler's Wells Ballet. And of course, um, at that time, the Sleeping Beauty Swan Lake and Giselle were three ballets that were actually the real backbone of the repertoire of the Royal Ballet. And so it was a question as a quarter ballet member of learning every single role that was available to the quarter ballet in those three ballets. Sleeping Beauty was a real challenge because of course, one was required to change um, from a court lady into a lilac fairy attendant um, and then into the garland dance and sometimes one of Aurora's friends and a nymph or a marchioness in the hunt scene in act two. And then in act three, you could be all kinds of things. So it was, what, what it certainly was, was every single act, every time the ballet was on. And tours to America meant that you danced the Sleeping Beauty sometimes five consecutive nights, Friday night, twice on Saturday and twice on Sunday, which meant you really did spend the whole of Monday in bed or doing your washing. And I mean, I, I just loved the music for this ballet. I, it, was, it was just a dream come true to be a member of this amazing company, this wonderful company, and to be able to dance to this glorious music. So whether it was Sleeping Beauty or Swan Lake, one just survived brilliantly on this diet of Tchaikovsky. When um, uh, Ninette de Valois, of course, she had, she was very much in charge when I joined in 1958. 
and I worked under her direction for five years before she retired. Um, of course, we've spoken, people have spoken many times about her. I've spoken about her being a most terrifying figure uh, because one could be very easily dismissed in those days. You got the sack very easily. And I was constantly worried that I was going to be sacked where, when I knew that what I wanted more than anything in my whole life was to continue to dance for this wonderful company. Um, De Valois took all the rehearsals for the Sleeping Beauty. She was very determined to have what she wanted. She explained sometimes very clearly and other times not at all. If she was in a very impatient mood, she didn't describe what she wanted. And so the ballet mistress would come running up behind you and whisper in your ear. We of course were performing in the Oliver Messel uh, production that he had made for the company that opened the Royal Opera House after the war in 1946. I thought all the costumes were completely beautiful. I loved wearing everything. And, um, but I never met Oliver Messel, as I remember. I don't remember ever seeing him at rehearsal or in the theater, um, which of course, uh, you know, is a disappointment. I'm sure I would remember if he'd been around. In 1963, Ninette de Valois retired and Sir Frederick Ashton took over the directorship of the company. And as was sort of expected after a little while in the sixties, he decided to do his own production of The Sleeping Beauty. And he used uh, Peter Wright, Sir Peter Wright um, uh, as his assistant and, and left quite a lot of it to Sir Peter. Although uh, Peter, uh, tells me that the garland dance in that production was definitely done by Frederick Ashton. And uh, Sir Fred had worked with a wonderful Italian designer called Lila de Nobili for Ondine in 1958. And so now here we are in the late 60s and she is asked to design the Sleeping Beauty. The costumes were... Uh, so beautiful, the period she chose was medieval. And I remember the most outstanding scene of all was the hunting scene. It was so beautiful. Um, the costumes were russet oranges and reds and the most beautiful. And all the girls had wonderful long red wigs, um, very curly wigs, very medieval. It was just beautiful. but. The disadvantage of that design uh, was that she chose uh, to use that medieval shape of the bodice for the fairies in the prologue. Now, by this time, I was a soloist, and so I was uh, dancing one of the fairies. In fact, I danced three of the fairies. But the bodices were very, very boned in order to give us a particular silhouette. And it meant that we could only raise our legs to a degree up to 45 degrees, which of course, even in the 60s was not acceptable. Um, nowadays, I don't know what dancers would have made of those costumes, but little by little, we pulled these bones out. So of course the costume changed its look entirely, but at least we were able to raise our legs at the required height in an attitude for the Sleeping Beauty. Um, when we first, when, when Peter Wright first was devising how he would make the fairies enter in, um, in the prologue. Uh, it was felt that it would be rather magical if the fairies could look as if they entered running um, down a, a sunbeam or flying down a sunbeam. And so I distinctly remember going in on a Sunday for a technical rehearsal and standing at the top of the slope that they devised for the fairies to run down. And me saying that there was absolutely no way that I could run down the slope. It was so steep. I said to Peter, there's only one way to come down and that's on our bottoms. So little by little, they lowered the angle of the slope until it was less acute, but they still had the streaming light. And uh, I'm sure it was very impressive. 
I mean, I was always on, so I never saw what it looked like from out front, but uh, it was much praised. This production was much praised and the costumes, of course, were very, very beautiful. When Sir Fred retired, he was followed uh, by Kenneth Macmillan as the director. And, and once again, um, Kenneth uh, chose in the 70s to make um, a new production of The Sleeping Beauty. This time he used Peter Farmer. And, uh, and again, um, uh, I had moved up the ladder. I was now a principal dancer. And so I actually danced Aurora um, only three times. And I have to admit, it was not really the role for me. Um, I, I wanted to know what it would be like to dance Aurora. And I actually asked Kenneth if, I, if he could cast me. Um, but I knew really immediately that it wasn't right for me. But I, it was immensely valuable for when I came later on to coach people in that role. Um, that production didn't seem to last very long because after Kenneth uh, retired in 1977, he was followed by Norman Morris. And Norman's background, of course, had been entirely with Rombert and also with very much with contemporary dance. Um, but he was now uh, obviously determined to make a success of his directorship of the Royal Ballet. And in order to make his mark with a, with a new production of The Sleeping Beauty, uh, he invited Dame Ninette to come back and mount what would inevitably be a, a production that was based on the Sergeyev original choreography. Um, but she made a new garland dance again, having made uh, the garland dance for the 1946 production, as I understand it. She now made another one. And this time her designs were by a very talented and wonderful man called David Walker. And these costumes were, um, again, very, very sumptuous, very beautiful. And this was the first time that I had the chance to uh, learn the role of Carabos. Um, it, was, um, it was one of my most cherished memories working with Dame Ninette on this role because she had uh, she always loved mime roles. She loved characters. She loved um, getting people uh, really to sink themselves, to absorb every aspect of a character. And so when she cast her carabosses, and there were three of us, the first cast was Lynn Seymour. I was second cast and Alfreda Thorogood was third cast. And what was fascinating about those rehearsals was that she worked the role completely differently for each of us. She had a, a different image that she wanted to convey for all of us. We wore the same kind of wig, but she even altered the makeup. And so uh, we had three very different carabosses. And apart from one of the very early productions when I had seen Gerd Larson perform Carabas. Ever since then, it had always been men. And of course, my first Carabas that I ever saw was Frederick Ashton. Robert Helpman did it, of course. And, and then later on, Ray Powell and Stanley Holden, many of the men. And I had never, I'd thought that uh, probably it would never be a role for women. But Ninette sometimes wasn't in favor of men doing female roles. For instance, even when we did Cinderella at one point, she took the ugly sisters, took the men out of the ugly sisters and gave the roles to women. So Carabos was an example of this, of this passion of hers for women playing these roles. So I, I danced, well, I say danced, it was really, there was no dancing in Carabos, but I performed this role or for longer than 10 years. Um, and it, it must be one of the roles I've done the most times in my career. I absolutely loved playing it. And of course, it was always fascinating because the auroras were always different. The princes were different. The fairies were different. And 
But again, you had this wonderful, wonderful score. When um, Anthony Dull became director in the late 80s, uh, it was inevitable that he too would want to produce a Sleeping Beauty. And he chose as his designer, Maria Bjornsson. And he studied very carefully uh, the details of the Sleeping Beauty. He researched very, very deeply and it mattered to him hugely that, that it was a real theatrical success. Of course, he wanted the dancers to be wonderful, but for Anthony, it was um, the lessons he'd learned watching Ninette and watching Fred um, and Kenneth, of course, but it was the entire stage picture that mattered to Anthony. He was himself capable of creating designs and in fact designed um, quite a lot of costumes for the company at one point. Um, and Maria uh, Bjornsson came with the company uh, to America because most unusually, we, we had our premiere of this production away from home. The first night was in Washington in the Kennedy Center. This was an enormous challenge because of course, we'd never seen the entire set erected and lit on the stage until we were in Washington. Maria had decided that she wanted to have uh, Princess Aurora make her entrance down a flight of stairs. And she created this terrifying flight of stairs um, for these poor ballerinas to come down and then get themselves, their nerves steadied once they'd reached the last step in order to dance the Rosadage. I mean, the entrance of Sleeping Beauty for uh, the entrance of Aurora is so scary. And even when you run through the colonnade and you poise for a moment before you actually come down onto the stage, I can't tell you what that feels like, knowing what you're about to go through with your four princes and all the roses and things. So the opening night was danced by Darcy Bustle, who was still very young, and um, it was her first Aurora. And I will never forget, somehow she kept calm. She didn't fall down the stairs. She managed this immense flight and, and danced uh, uh, like a dream. It was, uh, it was wonderful. President Clinton and Princess Margaret were in the audience and came on stage afterwards. So it was a, a really big deal. That production stayed uh, with the company until um, Anthony retired and Ross Stretton uh, took over the company. And he, of course, again, wanted to make his mark with the Sleeping Beauty. And he invited Natalia Makarova um, on the strength of the fabulous production that she'd made of La Baia Dare both for American Ballet Theatre and for the Royal Ballet. And um, he, he entrusted this production to her. It was very interesting. She again chose a female designer, another Italian, Luisa Spinatelli, uh, who created some absolutely beautiful drawings, beautiful designs. Uh, everybody, everybody seemed very happy with it. But for me, uh, one of the difficulties was that now the ballet, the choreography and the style of dance moved away from the Royal Ballet and everything that I'd known all my career. And it was as if she was refashioning every member of the company as if they danced with the Kirov Ballet. And this sat uh, uncomfortably with quite a lot of people of course, she worked extremely hard. She was absolutely devoted to this production. She was going to make, make a success of it come hell or high water. And she worked so hard with all the dancers. They loved working with her. She cared about them a great deal. But I felt that it was somehow it was a little bit fake because we weren't Kirov dancers and at, having admired the Kirov so much as I have always done, I felt that we were 
it made us look like poor relations. So when Ross departed and um, I was um, appointed director of the company, of course, I just felt that somehow we had to get back to our roots. And it was decided uh, by the board that we, we would find, they would find the money for us to have a, a production of The Sleeping Beauty. And having so adored the Messel, the Oliver Messel designs, the original production that I had known when I joined, <clears throat> and working with Christopher Newton, who had been a member of the Royal Ballet for even many more years than I had, um, we worked together on devising a production that was particularly Oliver Messel, but assisted by Peter Farmer. And Peter Farmer took on the role of adapting Oliver Messel's designs for the Royal Ballet. It turned out that Peter was not very happy doing this, actually. He would much have preferred to have had a complete production of his designs. However, we managed, we managed to get along. We, we succeeded in putting this production on um, and it was, it was 2006 and um, it was an immense amount of work as you can imagine. But Christopher and I, had, we had just the best time. I mean, it was, it nearly killed us of course, but the dancers gave us their very best. And um, I was, uh, in the end, I was thrilled with the production. I have to say that John and Anya Sainsbury were incredibly supportive of this production. And there were aspects of it that they felt uh, were too much Peter Farmer and not enough Oliver Messel. And so over the years, we, we little by little made various alterations. And, and I must say that I'm, you know, it means a great deal to me that this production is still with the Royal Ballet. And, um, and so far, Kevin O'Hare, the current director, has kept this production for the Royal Ballet. It, it means a great deal to me. And, and I just feel that it makes, it reminds me of some of the things that happened en route. Um, and the things that I read about it, I mean, I just love the fact that Robert Helpman, who I had a chance to work with as a dancer in a couple of productions, and I, I just so revered him. He, he said that he thought that Messel's designs were the best ever. And, and that he, Robert Helpman, had spent the rest of his career searching for another of equal talent, but he never found one. Beryl Gray remembers asking Oliver Messel why her lilac fairy costume was white and not lilac. And, and Oliver Messel is supposed to have said, trust me, it's better that it's white, but with all the lilac trims. So I think that he was, Oliver Messel was remarkable and um, revered. And, and I just, I'm so proud of the fact that uh, the production that we've, we made, we created in 2006, is still now with the company in 2022. And, and I'm hoping it might last at least another season. So, um, you know, it's meant a great deal to me to be in this ballet all my life, involved with so many, many roles in it, and then eventually having the great privilege of making a production for the Royal Ballet. I think that's all I have to say about The Sleeping Beauty. Now, where Thank do we go? <laughs> Sue? Hello, maybe someone can put my camera on. Oh. Right, I can put my camera on. There we are. There we are. Monica, thank you so much for, for taking us through that history. I mean, it is quite remarkable 
to um, to have your two talks together and to see the to to get the sense of continuity, moving right from the 1890 um, Russian Imperial Theatre right through to 1922 and this mm. sustaining this continuity of the ballet mm. um, as part of the classical tradition in um, in the Royal Ballet and in British Ballet in particular. It's so fascinating to hear your, your um, you know, experiences straight up front. I'm wondering if Jane and you would like to share, um, uh, share a screen, is that possible, Harris? And maybe you want to talk to each other or we can move straight to uh, Q&A. What would you like to do? I think we could do a Q&A, don't you think, Jane? Yes, yeah. Because okay. We've only got a 15 minutes or something left. Yes, so maybe Marcus could, um, could read out some of the questions. Thank you so much. And thank you both for your talks this evening. Um, we've got a few questions about archival materials uh, in the chat coming through. So maybe I'll just start by going back to your talk, Jane to ask um, about how you access these archival materials. Where we have a question from Georgina wondering whether the costumes shown, shown alongside the drawings are also in the VNA, um, and also questions about the photos um, you've accessed um, with Satina or Katina, apologies for pronunciation, wondering if the two wicked fairies um, are in some way recognizable in the photographs too. Right. Um, yes, the majority of the material that I've been showing is in the VNA. Um, not all the photographs are, are, are there, uh, but we do have quite a good collection, um, either in terms of originals. Um, yeah, I mean, we probably, we probably have as good a collection as you're going to find of, of um, photographs. Um, also costumes. We have a, a very extensive uh, collection. Um, of costumes from um, Sleeping Princess. Obviously, uh, certain characters such as the, the fairies, tutus uh, are never good at surviving. So that's always one of the, um, the problems. We have, for the fairies, we've got two of the trains that they walk at the entrance, but that's basically all um, of those costumes. Some of them are in a very dilapidated, some of the costumes are actually in a very dilapidated state. Um, for many years, they were sort of just stored in, in hampers, uh, not beautifully preserved as we try and do now. Um, so that creates also problems. Uh, in terms of people having access to the material, it's slightly embarrassing at the moment because there is no access, um, but it's only a few years. Uh, essentially, what is happening at the VNA is that uh, our stores, our former stores at Blythe House, are now closed. Everything has been audited is being packed up and will be moving across London um, and will be relocated uh, at uh, the former Olympic Park. Indeed, the VNA will be right next door to Wayne McGregor's studio. <laughs> so a little uh, sort of corner of dance um, in East London. Um, so it will probably open in 25. I mean, it could be 24, but I think it's safer to say uh, 25. Uh, and I think the public will probably have rather more access to the material. So the range of material we have includes um, obviously documentary material, there are costumes. We do have sets, but don't ask to see the sets because they are vast and there's no way, um, they were last unrolled in Battersea uh, and lots of paint flew off them. Um, so the usual challenges that, um, you know, it's not to say they won't ever be seen, um, but they do need a lot of conservation. Um, it's one of the challenges uh, of material surviving a hundred years. Um, we do have um, the drawings that I showed you. Uh, most of those come from the sketchbook by Randolph Schwaber. So he would sit in the auditorium and do his little sketches uh, ready to work up into uh, more finished drawings. But there's always an immediacy I find about um, sort of sketches and the annotations. Um, and obviously sometimes he doesn't have the right color to hand, but he will also give you something that says, you know, this isn't blue, it's, it's, it's lilac. Um, <laughs> so, so your eyes need to sort of accommodate the extra uh, information. So in fact, we do have a, a, a pretty good collection 
um, documenting uh, this production. Uh, and that was one of the things that I really wanted to try and show you um, uh, in my presentation was the visual aspect. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you so much for for talking us through some of those materials and and also the effects of the pandemic on on their storing and and how people can or or at the moment can't sadly access them. We've got another. So it's not the pandemic that's the problem. It's the move that's the problem. I mean, Apologies. obviously, packing everything up has been slightly more challenging than it ought to have been. Um, so so that that is the 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 sort of uh, sort of situation but um uh it, it's not a case that they are hidden for eternity they will be accessible again lovely and um we've got another kind of collection of questions which are constellating around preparing for roles or, or getting into character so i might ask um, Monica and Jane together. Um, Monica, we've got a question about how you prepared for the role of Carabas, the role of the outsider. Um, there's a sense of empathy for the character's mis mistreatment, which seems it might be close to the Perel fairy tale. Um, and also um, alongside that, a question um, from Geraldine about, um, you know, getting into to character, um, but having to kind of maybe contend with the difficulties of costuming. So how did the prince cope in the pas de deux with such an elaborate costume? Um, so maybe some, we can start from this general area about getting into to role from Monica, your perspective and, and Jane, your perspective from history. Well, I mean, uh, I think getting into the role of Carabos was, uh, was a wonderful experience because working with Ninette de Valois was, was always wonderfully challenging. I mean, she was impatient, demanding, um, but with great humor and uh, uh, tremendously alive. And you knew when you were in the studio with her, it was a real collaborative atmosphere. Um, by this point in my, in my career, I was no longer as intimidated by her. And um, she wanted to have a lot of fun. She wanted to really bring Carabos um, into the sort of 20th century, but in a, in a very different way. I mean, she, she loved the design that David Walker had done for, for Carabos. And we just, had, we just had so much fun working on it. And she would come, whenever she came to a performance, she always came backstage with several corrections. She, was, she never stopped working on things. And so that was, you know, that was wonderful for me. I, and I must have performed Carabos over more than 10 years, 12 years. And in fact, when Anthony Dowell did his production, he then reverted to the men doing Carabos because I think he very much wanted to do Carabos himself. So uh, the girls were out of the running. And then two or three years down the line, he asked me to come back and do it again in his production, which was very different actually. And the costume, um, had been made for a man and I never felt as comfortable in that costume as I had done in the David Walker but it was you know it's a great role to do um, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it I must say um, yeah Jane so I'm um, looking at some of those costumes and the, the challenges that they present um, I think we've got to remember that uh, they are photographed uh, so like the prince um, I'm not saying that he actually danced in all that here. Um, I think that's basically his wedding outfit. Um, and so just as Aurora changed out of hers and into a tutu, I think that he probably changed. I also think with the costumes, we have a big challenge because Bax uh, produced that book of um, designs. Uh, it came out uh, the year after um, and... Uh, uh, Levinson writes the introduction. It was obviously all sort of vaguely geared up to the hope that the production would go on in Paris. Um, but a lot of those designs, I think, are Baxian fantasies. They don't match up the actual costumes. Um, so again, it sort of flags up the, um, the, the, the questions that one needs to ask when one looks at things. Um, certainly, the Bluebird costume, the design by Baxter, I showed you for Idzikowski. It's a cost he didn't wear. He wasn't going to wear that. Um, yeah. There's always a problem. Remember, dancers have got to be able to move. Um, Bax, yeah. I think, I mean, Bax didn't respect the fact that dancers had to move. He would cut down his costumes, but there are, I mean, the poker said, you know, he never thought of the dancer. He thought of 
what it looked like. Um, so there are lots of questions. And actually, when you start looking at some of the costumes, you can see alterations. You can actually even see changes of colors. It's like when somebody's got a, um, just sort of painted over some of the costumes to change the color at certain times. Uh, so um, the obvious information requires another layer of investigation always. Yeah. I think that the, the, the story is that the Baxt costumes were not that comfortable to wear, whereas, of course, the Messel ones really were. But by then, of course, we were really into tutus, whereas Baxt still had his fairies in long skirts and bell skirts. And I must say, they didn't, considering what the choreography is for those variations, it must have been extremely challenging to dance in what would have been quite heavy fabric, I imagine. I think I think uh, some of the challenges that um, Lila and Oberly um, created, you know, yeah. were reflected also in Baxian's approach. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I wonder then if if I might just note at this point when while we're thinking about um, getting into character, or getting into to role, and and the difficulties, and and also Jane, exactly what you mentioned about when we look back, we might want to go under the the layer of the surface of of kind of what we're seeing, um, especially just just because the the question of blackface and performance came up in in your talk with relation to the ballet russe, um, that there there are a few kind of resources and um and links that i'm just going to put in the youtube chat uh if folks are interested in in thinking a little bit more about um how to 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 deal with these questions when they come up in in research um and also how to kind of combat or do some anti-racist work um against the kind of continued prevalence in the present day um but maybe um, as a last question, I was wondering if we could uh, think about some of the the, the concerns or, or, or ideas around repetition or, or, or modulation or change that have taken place over the productions that we've um, been encountering. So Alastair McCauley is asking, um, Diagolev and co made several changes to Pepita's ballet. Can you say which ones you know influenced De Valois and Ashton? Um, but also, um, Monica, um, we've got a question about how much of Nikolai Sergeyev's choreography is preserved in the Royal Ballet's current version of Sleeping Beauty. So how much change, has there been much change there um, or, or, or not? So who's going first? Jane, do you want to go first? There seems, there seems to be an awful lot of, a lot of things there to try and remember. Um, <laughs> um, to, to, in terms of... of um, Actual, actual um, choreography. I mean, it is difficult to really know, but I think it is very obvious that the. I think to me, one of the keys is is in fact, with the the set changing, you start focusing in a very different way um, in terms of, of uh, how people enter um, and the results of that. Your your space um, uh, element, I think, is something that is something that needs to be more thought about. Um, in terms of actually how, it, it is hard to really know um, how much, I mean, the dancers who came from the Mariinsky would obviously have had the knowledge and there isn't a great deal that sort of says, oh, you know, the choreography was radically changed, yes, there were options of having alternate variations at times that come through from the earlier works. Um, in terms of, um, you know, if you've, if you've got a reduced number, then of course it's going to be different. In terms of, um, I, it, is, it is, one of our big problems is that there are very few accounts by people who had seen the Russian production versus the London production. And so even when Beaumont is sort of saying, oh, you know, they've made these changes and they're better, he had no idea. You've been told that. Um, <laughs> he, it's, you know, the, the sort of, and then that gets taken for granted. That's, yeah. that's the authority um, yeah. that, you know, these are improvements. Um, I think also we've got to remember we are sort of, you know, 30 years on from the premiere. Um, 30 years is quite a time in yeah. Um, yeah. Any, any company, any you know, dancers' styles evolve, mm -hmm. uh, dancers' technique changes, doesn't necessarily get better, but different different areas are focused on. So that too would have um, 
uh, produce things. I think it is safe to say that with the Sleeping Princess, a lot of the dancers certainly didn't have the technique that we would expect today or that would have been seen in Russia. And that also has to be sort of taken into consideration. Um, I think one sort of got to guess. Now, how much did, I think, I think the important thing is that de Valois was somebody who looked at theatre. I suspect Sergeyev was not. And uh, this is not to be critical of notators, but there are a number of people who go to the book and say, this is it. And it doesn't come out as a theatrical experience. And for my money, as much as I love watching historical reconstructions, you know, it tells me a great deal. Um, I look at it and I say, is this good theatre? And that's what really matters um, for an audience. Yes, yes, I'd agree with you. I, I think that, I mean, in terms of uh, how much of Sergeyev is still with us, he's very much with us still. I mean, you know, we haven't really changed um, the choreography uh, much over the years. What's changed is how dancers dance. So technique has developed in some ways. Um, you know, if, if we could go back and see what that performance looked like in 1921, I mean, that's a sort of complete fantasy. I would just absolutely adore to be able to buy a ticket, go to the Alhambra Theatre and see The Sleeping Princess 1921. I mean, I think, you know, the, the Royal Ballet has always very much tried to respect the production that the Sergeyev did with de Valois. Uh, but bearing in mind that, of course, for instance, one of the um, areas that every choreographer has wanted to um, make his imprint is, is the garland dance. And, and I, you know, people don't talk about the garland dance much, but for me, it's absolutely fascinating because it's been choreographed by de Valois, by Frederick Ashton, by Kenneth Macmillan, by Peter Wright, um, and... Uh, more recently, Christopher Wielden for the production I did with Christopher Newton. And, and in fact, Christopher Wielden wasn't happy with the first dance he did. And so he, he redid it. And, and of course, you've also had so many different numbers of people. I think originally um, in, in, in the uh, Mariinsky, I think they had 36 people on stage for the garland dance. Whereas now we tend to have maybe just 12 women or eight women and eight men, 12. Uh, uh, Natasha Makarova's production uh, was probably the biggest that we'd known in that, in terms of the garland dance, because she went back to what she'd known at the Kirov. And that's 12 women, 12 men, and six boys and six girls. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so those little boys and girls were from the ballet school. And, um, and it, was, it was charming, it was charming. But of course, when, when Christopher and I did our production in 06, we went back to 12 women and eight men. And this was Christopher Wielden's choreography. So I think that, you know, you, you win some and you lose some. I mean, one of the fascinating things for me is also the, the different fairy names. Because the fairies are just, for instance, the Crystal Fountain is also known as Purity or Condide or Columbine. And, and the lilac fairy is, has sometimes been called the fairy of wisdom, but she's mostly the lilac fairy. But we do have all sorts of other things going on in fairy names. And it's those things that when you're doing a production, you know, you have to make a decision about. And uh, one thinks long and hard about the fairies' names. Do you go back? How far do you go back? Why do you go back? And, and what does it mean to an audience today? So I think... You know, in making a production of The Sleeping Beauty, you want to pay homage to a great work, um, a most magnificent score, um, a ballet that by which you measure um, a ballerina's technique and her gifts. Um, and also it says a lot about the style of the company, how you dance that ballet. Um, I think there's, you know, every reason to continue to dance the Sleeping Beauty, not every season, of course, uh, but regularly, because even today's dancers who've made a lot of progress technically still 
can't walk through the the Rosa Dage as if it was, you know, as if they were having breakfast. This is a, an enormous uh, mountain to climb. And every time you have a new ballerina attempting the Rosa Dage, you know, this is something that takes a lot of rehearsing, a lot of work, a lot of courage. I'm Lovely. concerned about the time, Marcus. How are we doing for time? Well, I think that's right, actually a brilliant point at which to wrap <laughs> things up. Um, Monica, I realize that you have another commitment. So um, it just leaves me to say to you, I mean, this has been so revealing, you know, this, this whole tradition that has come through. And we, we've got to think about this issue of transmission and reconstruction in a different way, I think, by getting your, and having your evidence, you know, Jane's scholarly evidence from the archive and having your, you know, embodied evidence, uh, De Monica, especially when you demonstrate, you know, the fire, it was wonderful to see you waving the arms. <laughs> I think it, it's a good point at which to say, I am absolutely delighted that you you have both drawn already several people to um, to help us in our fundraising, and um, you know we we want to stress that our events are always free and they're welcome to anybody. But if anybody feels they can contribute, there's I believe um, a link in the YouTube description for you to go ahead and think about that. And we just had a couple of days ago an, an absolutely wonderful um, anonymous uh, donation of a thousand pounds, which of course anyone is welcome to match, but, um, <laughs> but that isn't the point. The point is that it is so wonderful that you're, you're all here today, even though we can't see you all, which is most, uh, most distressing, but that we are a community and that we continue to learn about the practice and the history of dance in this way. So my huge thanks to you both, Jane and De Monica, and um, I hope we'll see you again face to face. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Sue. you. Thank you Thank very you so much. much, Sue. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And if you want to come to the next um, dance socks <laughs> meeting. Marcus will be leading it, or it's on um, Grace and the classics. We're talking about the classics as in the classics. <laughs> so that will be on the 7th of February, and there's a, a link to that as well. So really wonderful, wonderful talks tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Marcus. You. Thank you, Harris. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.